Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we are going to talk about Facebook. And you might be saying, Rick, didn't you just talk about Facebook yesterday? And the answer to that is yes. But who knew that a global pandemic would give us so much to work from, from our favorite social media provider? So Facebook, as you may or may not have heard, recently announced, revealed that they were going to be curtailing certain information on their platform related to the organization of protests around the coronavirus. And we're going to go into a little bit more depth and background about what that means. But that's the baseline that I want you to be thinking about as we talk about all these issues. Now, I've got a lot of tabs ready to talk about today because a lot of this is very contextual, is very nuanced, and ultimately relates to maybe a full half of a semester of constitutional law. So we're going to try to break it down. We're going to try to make it easier to understand in bite-sized chunks here. But when we get to the end of this video, one thing that you will note, and lawyers say this a lot, is that we can't necessarily know whether something has been violated here, whether Facebook has become what I will call a state actor, and we will get into that, because all of this is so facts and circumstances based, and really the courts haven't had the opportunity to adjudicate something like a digital social media provider changing what it is that they provide, potentially at the request of a government in the midst of a global pandemic. Those sets of circumstances, those specific facts are very problematic. They're so novel in their combination that the courts haven't seen fit to look at them yet, which means all of these actors, these governments, these governors, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, are acting in a kind of gray area with respect to the law, regulation, executive orders, constitutionality, and I don't begrudge them that. Navigating all of this is very, very difficult, but did Facebook do some stuff wrong here? The answer is maybe. So let's dive in. So we're going to start at the end of this kind of conversation because I think it's important to know where we're, where we are going when we talk about this rather than just kind of dive into what's happening here. So I've brought up an image of a tweet that was put out by Bad Legal Takes, which is a Twitter account that I really enjoy following. I highly recommend following it yourself if you're interested in these kinds of issues. They are constantly kind of highlighting things that people on Twitter have said, and they don't do it with any context. They just say bad legal takes. And so it's a fun little puzzle for the, the lawyers among us to go and look for what exactly was said here that was a bad legal take. And it's going to be pretty obvious as we look at this. Uh, so the tweet in question says, it's in response to what we're about to talk about, Facebook banning organization of protests on their platform. It says, ah, banning speech protest. What a measured and not at all confoundingly stupid response. You know, that's an opinion. That's not what is the bad legal take here. Then we get to Dan Jordan, who says, using Facebook is not a constitutional right, which is exactly correct, right? That's not the bad legal take either. Under the First Amendment, the Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, or particularly in this case of importance, the right of the people to peaceably assemble. And so Congress in this particular instance means the government. It's been interpreted to mean all branches of the federal government, really, whether that's judges or people acting on the executive branch's authority, all kinds of things like that. But Congress shall make no law does not extend to private actors. In fact, I wound up doing a virtual legality just a little bit ago about the fact that YouTube is allowed to ban basically whatever it wants. It's allowed to punish somebody like PragerU because it doesn't like what it's doing on its platform because YouTube is not the state. YouTube is not the government. Or as I framed it in that video, YouTube is not your friend, but it's also not the government. So the constitution doesn't protect you from what YouTube is doing. Now, if you're following along with this, you know that it's actually the states that are in open question here. California, New Jersey, Nebraska, not the federal government. So you might be saying to yourself, hey, Rick, the First Amendment only talks about Congress with a capital C. It's in the United States Constitution. It's not in the Californian Constitution necessarily, although most state constitutions are going to mirror this language. How does that apply to these various state governments? And the answer is in something called the incorporation doctrine which is a fancy judicial way of saying that when the United States passed the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that had this particular bit of language, nor shall any state 
deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That phrase, the due process of law, was deemed to incorporate certain aspects, and we won't get into the nuance there, but let's just say it incorporates the U.S. Constitution and the restrictions on the federal government against the state governments. So when we look at something like the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, you can read it through magic of judicial decision-making for purposes of this video that it applies also to the government of the state of Michigan or the government of the state of California or New Jersey or wherever because of the way the 14th Amendment was adopted. So we continue with this Twitter thread and we say, okay, where's the bad legal take? Speech is a constitutional right, but government involvement in shutting down speech is problematic. I look at that and I say, you know, my gut instinct is that that's roughly right. And that's actually what we're going to wind up talking about on this video. Although if you go and you follow bad legal takes, you'll get more bad legal takes from people responding to what they think is the bad legal take. And it's all very fun. And I highly recommend following the, the Twitter account. But then we get to the obvious bad legal take. The, the last thing here, go back to civics class. Speech is certainly not a constitutional right. Say, oh, okay, well, there's the bad legal take. But ultimately what it wound up having me do is say, hmm, the government's requesting Facebook help do this. These bans would present an interesting question. And then I have a couple of people respond to me and say, local, state, and federal is 100% allowed to ask. And then we get into all sorts of questions about what asking looks like from the government. And this will, of course, be linked in the description to this video. So you can check out the whole thread or you can follow me on Twitter to enter into these kinds of discussions. But suffice it to say, it's more nuanced than they are allowed to ask. And it doesn't mean that they're prohibited from asking. But whenever the state starts to get involved, one of the problems is that essentially the state acting can rub off on private actors. And we're going to look at some cases that talk about that. We're going to talk about one in particular that kind of helps evidence that as a, a thought process. But just intuitively, I think we can take a step back here and we can say as follows. If the government, whether that's the federal government or the state of California's government, is prohibited from doing something, they cannot still accomplish doing that something by just putting an intermediary in place to getting that done. So if we assume that the state of California would have certain difficulties prohibiting the organization of protests against their executive orders related to the coronavirus, and that's an assumption, that's part of this conversation is, are they even violating constitutional rights? And we don't know because all of this is novel. But if we assume that they would be doing that, can they get around that by asking Facebook to do it for them? And mostly the law, as you might anticipate, says no, you can't kind of hide the ball behind your back and do what we've otherwise said that you can't do by just using the tool of a private actor in between the action that you want to take and having them do it for you. That the law looks at that and says, no, you can't do that. And then worse for the Facebook of the world, they say, well, if you are acting at the direction of a government, if you are getting benefits from the government, if you're otherwise protected by the government, maybe you're a state actor yourself, right? The little subtext of the thumbnail that I did for this video says, did Facebook just become the government? And that's part and parcel to this question, because if the government asked Facebook to do something and Facebook was all on board, because the counter argument is that they were facing duress, which is another kind of component of all this. If they were all on board, is Facebook violating your constitutional rights? And again, you say, Rick, you've had like six or uh, more videos that say none of these private actors, Twitter, YouTube, whoever can violate your constitutional rights. And the answer to that is yes, that's true except if they are acting as the state. And did Facebook act as the state in this particular instance? Well, as we will see, I don't know. That's an open question. And part of that is because of some interesting reporting that happened yesterday. Now, if you're not familiar with the background of all this entirely, you should know that a number of states across the United States, especially if you're not from uh, here, the U.S., that a number of these states have had protests. I have a picture here of my capital, Lansing, here in Michigan, where what was supposed to be a car organized protest where they would essentially cause traffic in and around the Capitol, people wound up getting out. They did violate the social distancing guidelines. Many didn't have masks. So that's kind of an open question as part of this as well. But when it was organized, it was at least organized as something that would, 
potentially be safe, that everybody's going to be in their cars, they're going to do this. And so the government probably doesn't have the authority to step in, right? One of the things you've probably seen talked about throughout all of the discussion of the coronavirus is that our constitutional rights in the United States, they don't just go away because there's a pandemic. What winds up happening is that the U.S. government winds up having a special set of circumstances, what you might also see framed as a compelling interest in protecting the health and general welfare. And the federal government has that, but the police power, the actual power to enforce those kinds of things are held by the states. That's why you see so many governors on TV and the governors acting through executive orders. But just because that they have that compelling interest doesn't mean that they can just do anything under the sun. Right. The governor can't just declare martial law if they can't tie it to actually promoting the safety and general welfare of the populace. It's one of the reasons why the state of Michigan's executive order is, in my opinion, and reasonable minds can differ on these things, so problematic is because you have somewhat arbitrary decision making that, yes, you are allowed to buy X, Y or Z, but you're not allowed to buy paint. You're allowed to go get Hardware, but you're not allowed to buy flooring. All these various things that make it very difficult for people to understand. And the government in Michigan has not been great about explaining why those differences exist. And in my opinion, that resulted in a lot of this. But again, reasonable minds can differ. And that's not really important as to whether or not there is a legitimate grievance here as to understanding that these kinds of protests are happening. They're happening in various states. And what role Facebook plays in their organization is an important part of the story. So here we have Donnie O'Sullivan, who's a CNN reporter who tweets out at 9 a.m. yesterday that Facebook says it has removed promotion of anti-quarantine events in California, New Jersey, and Nebraska after consultation with state governments. He further says it is working to get answers from New York, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Pennsylvania as to whether anti-quarantine protest breaks those states' social distancing measures. So... All we have here from these tweets is whatever after consultation means. But we're going to watch how this winds up getting reported. And it certainly seems like Facebook was saying something slightly stronger. Now, whenever you look at an article online, it's always a little bit tricky to kind of get all the way down to the bottom of what was originally said. As we can see here, this was updated at almost 2 p.m. yesterday, even though these tweets go out at 9 a.m yesterday. So something was changed and we're going to see that there was at least confusion, if not changing of stories as part of this. So reading this CNN article, it says Facebook will remove some posts on anti-stay at home protests being organized in California, New Jersey, and Nebraska after consulting with officials in those states, a company spokesman told CNN on Monday. The protests run afoul of the state's social distancing guidelines, Facebook spokesman Andy Stone said. Facebook has come under fire as groups organizing anti-stay-at-home protests have popped up all over the platform. Stone said Facebook would take down posts created through the Facebook events feature that promotes events in California, New Jersey, and Nebraska. Note that we're not getting any extra context there, why these particular ones were singled out. And as we will see later on, this is reported as they're changing some of them, but not others. They wouldn't affect anything in Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Alania Alfaro Post, a spokesperson for New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, told CNN that the governor's office in Facebook had been communicating about the issue, but said the governor's office did not ask Facebook to remove pages or posts for events promoting lifting the provisions of the governor's stay at home order. So we have an updated article. We have a quote from a spokesperson for New Jersey that says, just so we're clear and you better publish this CNN, the governor's office did not ask Facebook to do anything. And part and parcel to that is we didn't make Facebook into a state actor. This isn't New Jersey doing something. Because as I said, YouTube can do whatever it wants. Facebook can do whatever it wants. If Facebook didn't talk to any of these states and just decided of their own accord to eliminate all of this, every reference to a protest anywhere, or even every reference to a protest that they themselves determined to be violative of the specific executive order in the relevant state, there is no question that they would be permitted to do so. Now, they might receive a lot of pushback from folks that think that Facebook and YouTube and Twitter should at least be advocating the value of freedom of speech, the value of peaceable assembly. And I think even Facebook likes to go out there with their marketing and suggest that they are valuing those things. 
But there is no question that from a legal perspective, they would have total authority to do that on their own. So one of the things that immediately happens here is that everybody starts to try to distance from this notion that the states asked Facebook to do this. We have other quotes. Nebraska's government was not aware of any specific anti-stay-at-home events and did not request that Facebook remove event pages. Now, that one at least makes a lot of sense. If they didn't know, and we are, of course, assuming that these are accurate and these are truthful statements from folks like Nebraska, that if they didn't know that there were any events, they would never have asked anybody to remove anything. And then the final quote here in this story from the Facebook representative, unless government prohibits the event during this time, We allow it to be organized on Facebook for this same reason, which is actually the opposite reason, events that defy government's guidance on social distancing aren't allowed on Facebook. Now that in and of itself is a very interesting stance for Facebook or any social media platform to take. If a government says that this specific protest is illegal Facebook will enforce the government's edict on that score. And the question becomes, is Facebook limiting that logic solely to global pandemics? It seems a little bit hard to put that particular genie back in the bottle. Is Facebook instead saying that when a government declares some protest illegal, Facebook will help make sure that that protest can't be organized? Because While the United States might have relative freedom, depending on the status of global viruses uh, otherwise, many countries don't share those same freedoms. Will Facebook help to cut down on protests in those other countries? And this logic really doesn't stop at at solely global pandemics, which creates a lot of problems for people. Also, If we go and we look at how this was reported immediately after this article went up in its original state, we get other folks, Oliver Darcy, also of CNN, describing it as follows. Anti-quarantine protests being organized through Facebook in California, New Jersey, and Nebraska are being removed from the platform on the instruction of governments in those three states. Because it violates stay-at-home orders, Facebook spokesperson Andy Stone tells Donnie, on the instruction of governments. Now, this winds up getting reported in various places, and you can look up this headline all over the place. Here in Politico, we have the headline, Republicans attack Facebook as network shuts down anti-lockdown protests. But if we actually look at what was described here, and you can't see it because I have that cut off for purposes of giving you a good image, the actual website address here is called Facebook shuts down anti-quarantine protests at state's requests. And you'll be able to see that link in the description to this video. So this was clearly named Facebook shuts down anti-quarantine protests at state's request at some point. And if we go and we look at the article, we see here that Politico is reporting the spokesperson said Facebook had been instructed by those state governments that the events are prohibited under the lockdown and social distancing orders that authorities have issued in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, a lot is put on the word instructed here. Facebook is going to tell a story now that says essentially what we did is we went and we unilaterally decided to ask these state governments whether they thought an organization of a specific protest was in violation of their executive orders. And if they said that, then we banned the event. Now, is that instruction? Is that advice? If Facebook reached out to the state, certainly that starts to look less like a state actor, but the states are still a part of the process. Facebook is still trying to work with these states for reasons that might be considered compelled speech of some kind. Facebook unilaterally kind of going and talking to these states might be interpreted as something that the states would like Facebook to do. And as part of the context for all of this, it's worth noting that Facebook has been under fire from all aspects of the United States government for years now. Facebook is operating in an environment where they are trying to make themselves look like good citizens of the world, good citizens of the United States and the various states that make up the United States in order to avoid regulation, in order to avoid things that would be damaging to its business model. So in that context, does them deciding to reach out to the state and the state giving them advice, does that constitute the kind of nexus, the kind of combination of state and private forces that could get both the state and Facebook in trouble? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's worth noting that all of this got reported as being at the state's request immediately yesterday. 
And that all got rolled back for reasons that we will look at under the law because neither Facebook nor the states want to consider Facebook as a state actor because Facebook is much more flexible in doing what it wants to do and doing what the states might want it to do as long as the states aren't instructing it, aren't ordering it, aren't suggesting that Facebook should do it or else it would be a shame if they were to regulate Facebook out of existence. That that isn't happening, of course, because Facebook is just doing this as a good citizen. Or as Facebook describes, we reached out to state officials to understand the scope of their orders, not about removing specific protests on Facebook. We remove the posts when gatherings do not follow the health parameters established by the government and are therefore unlawful. Either way, Facebook is determining on its own, through the advice of the states, perhaps, what is and is not unlawful. It's a kind of extra judiciary function. Does that make them a state actor if it's based on some kind of lawfulness under the executive order? Probably not in and of itself, but the question becomes something that we are unlikely to know if if no lawsuits are brought, and that is what exactly the states told them. And that statement that you see here in the Politico, this article doesn't make a lot of sense because it was clearly edited. This is described as saying, the statement followed confusion over whether states had instructed Facebook to remove the protests from its platform. Earlier Monday, a spokesperson said that events that defy government's guidance on social distancing aren't allowed on Facebook. Meaning not passive guidance, at least not in the way that any of the reporters read it and not that Facebook appeared to mean, but government guidance, meaning we're on the phone and the government's telling us what shouldn't be allowed on Facebook. That sounds like instruction and maybe Facebook is right and that wasn't ever what they meant, but it certainly calls into question the entire rubric under which Facebook is operating. That's the Politico, right? So then you get Andy Stone, who, remember, is the one that Oliver Darcy references saying that these were instructions of governments. He comes on. He's the head of, or or maybe he's not the head of, he's a part of communications at Facebook. He says, just want to clarify that Facebook reached out to state officials to understand the scope of their stay-at-home orders, not about removing any specific protest events from Facebook. And even that is too vague, right? That's the same statement that we saw earlier, but we can't understand precisely what it is that Facebook asked. And honestly, it strains belief that Facebook just decided to unilaterally go to these various governments and say, hey, we might have some stuff that's problematic on our platform. Do you think it's problematic? What do you think? Do you think it's a violation of your executive order? Maybe. Maybe they wanted cover. Maybe it's a CYA move for what they are going to do in removing it. And they wanted to be able to say that the state governments were a part of this conversation and then only later realized that, oh, that's a potential problem for legal liability. Because if they're a state actor, if the state did this through them, that is easily challengeable in court. I'm not saying that challenge would be won. The coronavirus COVID-19 presents a novel problem in jurisprudence. And whether or not people are legitimately able to exercise their otherwise constitutional right to protest is an open question in the midst of a pandemic and under executive orders that are properly entered into under the various emergency acts of these states. But it's not a guarantee, and it is certainly more challengeable in court if the state asked Facebook to do it than it would be if Facebook just did it on its own. So you have a whole mess, a whole spaghetti of various legal rights and consequences. And you can see both Facebook and the states running as far afield as possible from each other because they understood perhaps too late that even having that relationship as part of this conversation is problematic for everybody. And the Politico picks up on that. It says coronavirus protests test Facebook's free speech pledges. That's protests, not protests. It's not the verb, but it's all good. So coronavirus protests test Facebook's free speech pledges. It's almost a tongue twister. And we get into a lot more quotes here about what we were just discussing. It says Facebook initially indicated that it had removed the protest information at the request of states whose authorities said they violated restrictions on large public gatherings. And then the company later clarified that it sought guidance from the states, but made its decision to take the post down on its own. Okay, that's useful. We got the spokesperson. We already have that quote. And then it said CEO Mark Zuckerberg offered a slightly different explanation than that spokesperson on Monday morning, suggesting that Facebook removes content that disputes social distancing practices and therefore poses a risk of imminent physical harm. 
Now, social distancing practices, as anybody who has followed this news story knows, is not a terribly useful turn of phrase. It can mean everything from six feet apart to wearing masks to not being able to buy paint at the Home Depot. So what Mr. Zuckerberg means here is of importance because, in my opinion, there are legitimate grievances about the the margins, the borderlines of what these executive orders do. And those protests are at the core of what the Constitution is designed to protect. So if you are otherwise organizing and you are maintaining six feet and you're wearing masks, but you disagree that you shouldn't be allowed to buy paint at a store here in Michigan, should Facebook be allowed under orders from Michigan as instructed by Michigan or maybe just as getting information from Michigan, should Facebook be allowed to just remove those things? if they are otherwise a state actor because of that connection with the state. My argument would be no. And certainly Facebook taking this tack that says anything that disputes a social distancing practice poses a risk of imminent physical harm calls into question what we are talking about, right? The six feet, the masks, those are kind of the foundational fundamental social distancing practices. And then the rest of the rules that the states have enacted, and Michigan is not alone there, I think are open to question. Because again, the pandemic changes the way your rights are to be received by you under these various constitutions, but it doesn't eliminate them. The state still has to have a compelling interest in whatever it's ordering. You can't buy that paint. You can't jet ski, whatever it is that they're ordering. And I apologize that I know Michigan's executive order better than the other states, but that's probably no surprise since I live here. And Having that compelling interest needs to be explained, needs to have a nexus to actually protecting safety and health and general welfare. And so it should be challengeable. And maybe the state wins that challenge. I don't know that because I haven't seen that data because the government, the government and the governor haven't put that data out. But that that protest is really part and parcel to what it means to have First Amendment rights in the United States at all. And when Facebook steps in, especially if it was actually instructed by the states to step in, that gives me a lot of pause. Zuckerberg continues, certainly someone saying that social distancing is not effective to help limit the spread of coronavirus. We do classify as harmful misinformation and we take that down. At the same time, it's important that people can debate policies. Sure, debating policies is important. Is debating policies part of organizing protests? He doesn't really get that far. Then we get kind of some blowback from noted right-wing institution, the American Civil Liberties Union. Facebook, which controls a platform for the speech of billions, should not be censoring political speech online. This is especially true now when questions of when and how to reopen the country are among the central political questions and online platforms are the main vehicle for expression. Now, notice that this is framed by the ACLU as a should, right? Not a must, not necessarily a legal obligation, but that Facebook, which has this position in American and global society, should be in favor of free speech concepts, should be in favor of peaceable assembly concepts. And yeah, maybe we can have a debate about whether an assembly in the midst of coronavirus is peaceable, but that's where that debate should take place. And potentially by law enforcement, and the legal apparatus that has to go and prove certain things at the state level, rather than the state going around that apparatus by simply asking a private actor to do its job for it. David Green, Civil Liberties Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, argued that Facebook seemingly decided to remove protests based on whether they violate state law, and that provides an objective yardstick. Still, he said that without further clarity, it can be very difficult to judge the fairness of something, and to make sure that it actually is being implemented in a way that doesn't disadvantage certain groups or certain types of protests, right? Facebook isn't being terribly clear about whether or not it's interpreting the law on its own. Certainly, if it's having conversations with these states, it's getting the state's own interpretation of the executive order, not from the judges, not from the court system, which wouldn't give that advice absent a case or controversy in any event, but from the very people that wrote the executive orders in the first instance. So these states are telling them what they mean, and Facebook is acting on that instruction, that advice. And maybe that's fair, maybe that's not. Maybe coronavirus gives you these facts that make it make sense in this particular instance. But as I wound up writing on Twitter in respect of this, I don't love this precedent. 
right? When we talk about freedom, when we talk about how social media should be used, how it can be used, I do think that coronavirus presents this novel case where maybe you can come up with a reason that Facebook or Twitter or YouTube should be acting to prevent these people from getting together, prevent this organization because it's going to be harmful, it's going to cost lives, all these various things. But as I've said earlier in virtual legality, as you will hear if you go to law school or if you've been to law school, bad facts make bad laws. In this case, bad facts make bad precedent. They make bad regulations. They make bad ways in which companies operate. And this is no different. In the midst of coronavirus, which God willing is a very novel situation in my lifetime and yours, in the midst of this, you are seeing various eroding of constitutional rights, of civil liberties, of concepts like peaceable assembly and freedom of speech. And to the extent you see something like this where Facebook is saying, well, if the government declared it illegal, I guess we'll just lop it off our site. That becomes an immense problem for when the government decides to make something illegal that is otherwise constitutionally protected. And if they go and they tell Facebook, hey, we said this was illegal, what should Facebook do? And I think right now, Facebook has decided that they will listen to the government rulings on these various things, but they've put themselves in a precarious position because if the state is a part of that decision-making process, including through instruction or advice, they might have significant issues. Continuing here, Politico makes some good points about what Mark Zuckerberg has said in the past on these things. Zuckerberg laid out an aggressive approach to freedom of expression in a speech at Georgetown University last fall, though he acknowledged that free expression has never been absolute. Zuckerberg cited social and civil rights activists over the centuries, from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King Jr., to the Iraq War opponents of the early 2000s as examples that inspired his stance, saying free speech and protests have enabled progress no matter how disquieting they felt at the time. Now, what's noteworthy about that particular paragraph is that Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, other protesters were all operating outside the bounds of acceptable law at the time in which they lived, right? Protests of segregation in the Deep South in the 60s, protests of the slave trade, and various other things that we can look at now in 2020 and say, yes, those were unjust laws, those were unjust regulations and rules, and they deserved protest. That makes sense to us right now, but if Facebook existed and encouraged having a policy that said, well, if the government says it's illegal, we'll take the right to protest, we'll take that organization off of our website, is a problem. And what is potentially a worse problem is that they'll only take some of them off if Facebook otherwise agrees with the politics in question. That's part and parcel to this conversation that we've been having now for years and years and years as to whether Facebook and Twitter and YouTube deserve the liability shield that the various acts of the United States give them, especially when they start leaning in one direction or the other. And if you've heard me, you know that I have basically said that these entities, whether you like them or not, should have that authority. But in terms of whether or not it presents a good product, a good service, If Mark Zuckerberg is going to say, well, in this case, we're going to listen to the government, and maybe in every case, that's its own problem with respect to values of freedom of speech, values that the United States citizenry generally holds dear, or is Facebook going to say, we're going to do it here, but maybe we're going to ignore the government over here, but listen to it over here, and then what is allowed on Facebook, what isn't allowed on Facebook. You'll start to get a pretty clear picture of what they think is worth protesting and what they think is not. Because very often, protests, civil disobedience, things that can get you thrown in jail are going to be illegal in whatever state or location in which they are located. Finally, this Politico article quotes him as saying the following. Some hold the view that since the stakes are so high, They can no longer trust their fellow citizens with the power to communicate and decide what to believe for themselves. I personally believe this is more dangerous for democracy over the long term than almost any speech, which is hilarious to me 
because it was only yesterday that we did a long form video about how Facebook was declaring as fake news certain things that were opinion pieces, certain things that were definitely not something that could be easily discredited, even if I disagreed with the ultimate conclusion on the premise that it was so dangerous that people shouldn't be allowed to click through to the article, right? I covered this yesterday, the trouble with fact checking. And the particular case was a New York Post opinion piece done a month ago or two months ago that talked about whether or not coronavirus could have escaped from a Chinese laboratory. And whether or not that ultimately is determined to be the case or not, it is undoubtedly the case that the way the article was framed, incendiary as it was, it was an opinion. It was a set of circumstantial evidence that was put out there that led to a specific opinion that this author had. And while I don't necessarily agree in the strength of the case, there was nothing terribly offensive about the logic that was used to put it together. And Facebook wound up having somebody that worked at the laboratory that was being attacked say, "Uh uh-uh, no, everything's all good there. This is completely incendiary. And it actually said, this fact checker, that it was a personal problem for them that this article existed. So whether or not that's independent is something that you can check out that video to have my discussion of. But the fact that Zuckerberg actually goes out there and has these quotes, says these things like, hey, some people believe that these articles, even if they present bad ideas, are too dangerous and they should be cut off. And he says, I personally believe that's more dangerous for democracy than almost any speech. He's correct in this paragraph. He's correct in the signaling here about the constitutional hierarchy and how people should think about the battle of opinions and ideas and things like that, but he's not correct in how he actually operates his platform. So when you also get quotes that are things like this, hey, I believe in civil rights activism, I believe in civil disobedience, I believe in the change that those things can foment, but also... Hey, if the government declares it illegal, I guess we'll just not allow people to protest or to organize those protests on our site. How could anybody not look at that particular kind of logic and say, oh my God, I don't know that I believe anything you say, Facebook. And this ultimately becomes very dangerous. And you see that in an article that was also put up on the same day yesterday by The Guardian we have here that pulled together a bunch of different quotes. Uh, Mass public gatherings that ignore social distancing recommendations may well be creating a public health danger, which is part of this story, to those protesting in their communities. Again, Vera Eidelman with the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. But speech about government responses to the pandemic from relief packages like CARES to stay-at-home orders is core political speech, right? This is the main political commentary that is happening in our lives today. So, Yes, maybe you can ban these protests. Maybe the state can even use Facebook to ban these protests because maybe it's not violating somebody's constitutional rights. But it's as close as we can possibly come when you talk about these people are protesting the actual executive orders that are forcing them to stay at home regarding this entire situation. And so they are actually talking about the situation that you would use to enforce that stay-at-home order. It is essentially... Uh, a snake eating its own tail of importance because yes, you got to keep people safe, but also they can protest the way you have deigned to do that. And that kind of right has to be given a certain amount of importance in the way that you interpret your laws. And so you have to be very, very, very careful about rescinding that right if you are to comport yourself with the U.S. Constitution. CNN reported that Facebook had removed events pages for anti-quarantine protests on the instruction of governments in those three states, but the company spokesperson later said that it had spoken to government officials just to understand the scope, as we discussed. The question of whether Facebook took action against the protest pages on its own initiative or had acted at the behest of government officials is an important one. We've got a quote here from Jennifer Brody of Access Now. She says, informal requests from governments are extremely problematic. There should be transparency around takedown requests. State governments covertly nudging Facebook does not align with human rights norms or with the norms that we would expect in a a free society. Indeed, if a state government were to make such a request of Facebook or any other platform, it would be subject to challenge in court, unlike Facebook just acting on its own. The normal democratically accountable way to go about this is that the government issues an order to Facebook to take down particular content through a legal mechanism that has safety protocols that otherwise has the government have to go through certain steps. This is the difference between accountable governance and unaccountable companies. 
A government that makes this decision is subject to law. They are subject to real legal constraint and remedy. Facebook, as long as they aren't a state actor, is not. And that's ultimately why I wound up bringing up some cases here, right? The question becomes, is Facebook acting at the behest of a U.S. state or potentially the federal government, although we have no indication of that at this point in time? And that's a very, very complicated question. I have brought up a case which is only analogous. It doesn't specifically speak to this issue. As I said, this issue, if it were presented to the courts, would be entirely novel. But I think through this kind of conversation, you can start to see how difficult this is and the kind of mire that Facebook and the state of California or New Jersey or Nebraska or whomever would find themselves in by even having a conversation that could be deemed to be some kind of instruction. That if the state is involved in Facebook's decision-making process in any significant way, everybody involved could have a problem. Now, this is the case of Wickersham versus the city of Columbia, Missouri. And I will kind of go over this in very rough detail. There's a lot of talk here. If you haven't read a case before, they give a lot of background information. It's all very useful. But for our purposes, in this particular case, the defendants were operating an air show. And by operating that air show, they were using a tarmac and they asked the city's police to help them organize security and to enforce certain rules that they had against solicitation, against petitioning, against things that would otherwise be protected by the First Amendment. And in this particular case, the court is then evaluating whether or not the veterans organization, I believe it is, that is running this air show, that is otherwise private, nobody questions that it is otherwise private, is acting as the state when it organized the security protocols with the police department, which is obviously a state entity, and that police department is enforcing them on its behalf. And we get to the standard of review in this case, and it says the following. In the context of First Amendment cases, courts normally assume irreparable injury because the loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of time unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. The public has an interest in preventing constitutional violations, particularly ones involving speech, and the rights of the city and the corporation will only be curtailed to the extent required by law. So the question is, are the defendants state actors when they restrict First Amendment activities at the air show? The city of Columbia is a state actor because it is a creation of the state. Easiest court decision you'll ever see. The city? Yeah, that's a state actor. It's a piece of the government. If the corporation is a private party and the air show is held on their private property, then plaintiffs have no right to speech of any kind at the air show. On the other hand, if the corporation is a state actor, in quotes, as a term of art, when it restricts its speech, then in that limited context, it will be treated like the government. The court can look at it and say, you violated these folks' constitutional rights because for this purpose... You are the government of the city. You are the government of the state, whatever it might be. Now, the Supreme Court has acknowledged that the state action doctrine has not been a model of consistency, perhaps because it is so fact dependent. Now, if you haven't read a lot of cases, if you haven't gone to law school, this is one of the things that will open your eyes when you read through all these cases. You think society is run on a set of rules that are relatively easy to interpret, or if they're not easy to interpret, at least they are consistently interpreted. And in a lot of respects, that isn't the case. Sometimes that's because the specific item hasn't come up to the court often. Sometimes it's because it's just really complicated, as is the case here. Or sometimes it's because you have different political constituencies that have a very high level of interest in the question at hand. In this particular case, what we've got is somebody interpreting whether or not a private actor is acting as the state by virtue of the facts and circumstances surrounding the specific case, which means that every given case is reanalyzed on those facts and circumstances, and you wind up with not so great precedent. Ultimately, the court decides it in every specific case, and that would be no different here if someone were to sue Facebook as a state actor for banning this organization of the protest rallies. The court continues in Wickersham. There is no single test for determining when there is a state action, particularly when the dispute involves the First Amendment. They then quote to other precedents as relevant factors to consider are the actor's receipt of government assistance and benefits, whether the actor is performing a traditional government function. Now here, there's no question, Facebook is not performing a traditional government function. 
Having social media infrastructure is not something traditionally and exclusively the province of either a state or federal government. Now, whether or not they're receiving assistance and benefits is somewhat of an open question, especially in the context of the fact that Facebook and social media in general is very likely to be re-regulated, to have new rules placed upon it in the very near term. That's my opinion, but I think Facebook is operating under that assumption as well. Whether there is such a close nexus between the government and the challenged action that it is fair to treat the private actor like the state, meaning that it is so close to what the government asked for and what was done that it's fair to treat the private actor as just doing what it was told. Does the government provide significant encouragement, either overt or covert? And here's where we get into, okay, if you take a phone call from Facebook, if you have a long conversation, if you explain that these are the rules, and yes, you think X, Y, or Z posts are violative of those rules, Is that significant encouragement? What if Facebook tells them what they are planning, assuming that Facebook is being accurate and that they reached out to these states and they say, hey, we're going to ban these posts. Can you tell us which posts are a problem? We're going to ban these posts. Can you interpret these rules for us? And now the state knows that that's what's going to happen if they give Facebook this information. Is that significant encouragement, overt or covert? And does the private actor operate as a willful participant in joint activity with the state or its agents? That seems clear that they are. Neither the state nor Facebook is saying, hey, we're doing this under duress, right? If the state came to Facebook and said, you should ban these posts or else something bad is going to happen to you, we enter into a similar analysis to this, but we get into the place where, hey, California might be in trouble, but maybe not Facebook. Generally, the law doesn't require you to operate outside of duress. If the state is coming to you and threatening you and it would be a reasonable person that would uh, assume that that threat is real and would otherwise destroy your business. You should tell somebody, potentially you should whistleblow, you should do those kinds of things. But the the law is going to look at you uh, more kindly as having operated under duress of the state in question, of the government in question. If, however, you were a willful participant, that question becomes, okay, maybe you are the state of California for this question. Maybe California acted through you. And then you get a whole bunch of other analysis here. And ultimately, I don't think there's anything specific in the language that I wanted to call out in the rest of this case. But the court finds that these airshow runners, these airshow runners were the state, were a state government that were violating the First Amendment rights of these people that wanted to pass out petitions on their grounds because the city and the police department was so involved in essentially establishing the security protocols, in enforcing the rules that the, uh, the, the air show organizers were utter, otherwise putting in place, that because of that, these air show organizers were going to be deemed the state. Now, if you are paying attention at home, you'll note that that's a pretty weak kind of argument. They aren't operating solely as the state. They put some rules together and the police is enforcing them essentially as private security. But the fact that the state, the city in this question was operating at their behest helped put that security protocol together, was doing more than just kicking trespassers off their grounds, but was actually encouraging the efficacy of the rules that these organizers put in place that those organizers were deemed to be state actors. So it doesn't necessarily take a ton. On the other hand, as this case itself pointed out, it's very facts and circumstances based. And as a matter of fact, One case that you might see as being referenced, if you see anybody else kind of discussing this issue, and please let me know if you do in the comments to this video. I'd love to see what other people are saying about these kinds of things. One thing that you might see is referenced as analogous, which is a very recent Supreme Court case that I don't think is a great analogy for what's happening here, is the case of the Manhattan Community Access Corp versus Halleck, which ultimately determined, and maybe we'll read the whole abstract here, that a public access cable company that was otherwise given a license to be that public access cable company by uh, New York City was not operating as a state actor when it decided to kick off some content that was otherwise critical of the uh, public service cable company in and of itself, that they had the right to determine what content was on that service. And the main thrust of this was basically because they weren't performing an exclusively government function. Now, if you heard me say in Wickersham that Facebook is definitely not performing an exclusive government function, that is in fact the case. And if Facebook was just operating on its own, 
If it didn't have any conversations with the state, there's no question that I would maybe be making this video to comment on what Facebook is doing, but I wouldn't be having this corollary question of whether or not they were a state actor. And that, to me, is more interesting because everybody's in trouble if they wind up being a state actor. But if they were just operating on their own, I think this court case is good. It says, hey, okay, even if somebody licenses you, even if the government gives you certain authority over certain things, if the government didn't tell you to do something, if you're operating of your own accord and you're not doing something that usually only governments do, then we're not going to hold you to constitutional violations. In this particular case, you come outside of this, this case, this holding, because you've got an additional component. You've got to dig down. You've got to figure out what exactly was the content of these conversations. Did the state actually instruct Facebook? The reporting early on said that they did. You've got headlines in various entries on the HTTP line that say, yes, that's how we are describing this. You've got Politico saying that's what Facebook told us initially. And then you have everybody walking it back very, 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 very fast. And not to sound conspiratorial, that tends to suggest to me that somebody got some phone calls. Somebody understood what was in play here. Somebody came to the understanding that if the states ordered this of Facebook, everybody was in trouble. And so to answer my question in the thumbnail, yeah, if Facebook was instructed by the state and they willingly went along with it, or even if they reached out in the first instance and received instruction and willingly went along with it, and the state was a part of significant conversations and they knew what Facebook was going to do, you've got significant constitutional issues. And maybe, just maybe for the first time in virtual legality, You've got a tech giant that could potentially be sued in court for violating someone's constitutional rights. That's been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, please like, please subscribe, please tell your friends. We are always trying to grow the channel. We love having these conversations, and God knows the age of coronavirus has given us a lot to talk about with how these various entities and pop culture are dealing with this very unique situation in both United States and global life. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.